So, to talk a little bit about, uh, about me, I guess. I'm uh, the director of regional security at a large international Fortune 1000 company. Don't let the uh, the D word fool you. I am technical and actually do work, so it's a, it's a little interesting. Not used to that, I guess. Uh, so I have experience with penetration testing, exploitation, uh, web application security, wireless, and physical security. Uh, prior to my current job as a director, I was a VP and partner of a fairly large information security consulting company. And all we would do is basically break in everything. I'm <coughs> uh, the creator of the Social Engineer Toolkit. Does anybody ever use that? Hey, it's good to see you. Anybody ever use Fast Track? I created that too. Um, have I had a military background? I was in the intelligence community. I was in the United States Marine Corps. I did a couple of tours in, in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and intelligence related activities. Uh, so that's pretty good. Now, before I get started on my, my original conversation, just kind of want to talk about a little bit of different uh, Metasploit flags that weren't necessarily covered that could definitely be important when you're going through something. Now, if you saw in Martin's presentation, he used uh, MSO8067. Now, that's specific. Uh, <laughs> Were you actually going for something that I think you were? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't in the office. You're going for the sad maniac community? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> one thing with MSO8067 is uh, the actual exploit itself is very dependent on the operating system. Uh, reason being is because it uses a method for data execution prevention bypass uh, that's very specific on memory addresses. We saw in Elliot's presentation, um, he was you know, hard coding specific memory addresses in to do the jump ESP. Well, similarly to MSO8067, based off of what different service pack you're using, completely changes memory addresses. So when you see an exploit that's out, you see an exploit out for like, you know, Windows XP Service Pack 1, Windows XP Service Pack 2, Server 2001, Service Pack, or Server 2003, Service Pack 1, Service Pack 2. Reason being is, again, because you need those specific memory addresses in there. Now, Metasploit does a pretty good job of finding what version of the operating system that's currently running, uh, but sometimes it can't. So I wanted to show you something really neat. And I'm going to need to talk to demo guys. I'm just going to basically do all live demos here. So we'll we sacrifice Elliot to the demo guys. Yeah, where's Elliot? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to set this payload up. We'll do um, interpreter. Let's do bind. And we're going to target this uh, server 2003 service pack one. Now, the actual exploit itself, if, you show, if, you, if I show options, it's set up properly, right? So I have my, I have my R host, I got my L port that I'm going to go on to, and I'm doing a, a bind interpreter console. But when I go to exploit it, look what happens. See here, fingerprint window, service without the new service pack one, language unknown. Could not determine the name of the exact language pack, exploit completed, no section was created. So in this instance, we don't have a successful exploit, right? Obviously, it didn't exploit the system. Reason being is, based off of the different language packs, changes the memory locations. So what you can do is you do show targets. So you can see the different target versions that are up there. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time, what, you're going to be targeting English. So you can probably assume that this server is going to be running English. So let's go for this. And we're going to specify server 2003 service pack 1 English. And if you look in parentheses, it says NX or no NX. NX is just abbreviated for depth or no depth. With server 2003 service pack 1, service pack 2, and Windows XP service pack 2, service pack 3, depth is enabled by default. So 99% of the time, you're going to have a pretty good successful clip uh, if you go after the depth uh, enabled operating systems. So we'll just set our target to 7. Now we're going to exploit it. Boom. So, just so you know, when you run an exploit, there's that target availability. Uh, again, the auto targeting is generally pretty good, but again, you're not going to always have that. And one thing I also want to show too is in, in Martin's presentation, he shows you how you migrate to a different process, right? So, say for example, you're doing a client side exploit, and I'll, I'll show you how the host would set. Uh, but when you're going through and doing client exploits, as you go through and you get that interpreter session, you hit the X button, the browser closes, the process that you're running on. Is automatically going to is automatically going to close and shut down, so you no longer have your uh, session, right? So you have to be very quick. You know, if, if the user sees a pop-up box happen, or you know, if the Internet Explorer starts running, you know, pretty crummy, what he's going to do is going to close it out, right? So what you can do is if you go to Show Advanced, you see in here there's this Auto Run Script flag. You can just do Set 
auto run script, and do migrate dash f. So what's going to happen now when we exploit this, it's going to open up a hidden process from notepad.exe and automatically migrate to it for us. So now when that user goes to close that browser, we'll have a separate process running. We don't have to worry about them closing it out or you know, them, you know, us losing our session. So just different options you can mess with. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about the Social Engineering Toolkit first of all. The Social Engineering Toolkit, um, if you don't know, Social Engineering is a very, very heavily used attack vector right now. And, and why not? We're generally pretty dumb to these types of attacks. I mean, our, our human behavior, the way we behave on a daily basis, is pretty much the same for almost every individual. We're generally trusting of an individual until they you know, violate that trust or a certain part of aspects that make them look shady. Um, so, you know, Martin came in and he was walking through and he's got all these tattoos on me and he comes in looking all mean. Well, obviously my guard's going to be up. But if I walk in and I'm in a suit and tie, you know, I look important, your guard's going to be down. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. The social engineering attacks are really on the all-time high. He looked at the, I hate to use the, the media as this, but the Aurora attack. The Aurora attack was, was you know, Google got compromised, got breached by hackers. Uh, reason being is because of social networks and the trust factor that they have with their friends. It uh, looks like the breach originally came from a social network site where they hacked friends of executives in Google, and then they were able to basically deliver payloads to Google, um, compromise them, and have full access to some aspects of their network. So, you know, these attacks are very, very targeted. So, has everybody heard of Apt? Everybody's heard of Apt? For Davia? Huh? <laughs> yeah, what? Uh, so, Advanced Persistent Threat. I do a lot of work with a lot of different agencies out there, and you know, not to use the buzz, buzzword, but advanced persistent threat is definitely out there. I mean, there's there's state-sponsored organizations <coughs> trying, that, that are out there and uh, always trying to attack us. You know, I, I heard one of the one of the uh, gentlemen uh, from one of the agencies say, you know, hey, why would you know? Well, let's let's take an individual who works for a corporation in the security department, a company. I'll pick any. How many people do you have in your team for security? Two. Who am I? How many do you got in your? 15? China says, hey, I need this division of 1,000 people to target this organization and steal their intellectual property. So you have two, or 15, and they have 1,000. Who's going to win? <laughs> Probably not the 15. Unless you got me on the team. No. <laughs> but uh, to be perfectly honest, it really is a serious threat out there. Um, the, they, the intellectual property game is, is big for them. You know, why would I start up a paint business when I can just steal the paint recipes and start my own? Um, you know, or why would I you know, create a content filtering uh, company when I can just steal my own code and do that? So it's actually a funny story. One of the, um, there was a, I can't remember the name of the company, but there's a content filtering company uh, that reported a breach. And they're able to trace it back to China, which is not it. Of course, they didn't do it. And uh, six months later, that code was in the Great Firewall of China. So my question to them is, how the heck do they handle updates? I mean, do they rehack them and then steal the code and then push the updates? I don't know. It's pretty complex. So why is it so effective? Well, because we're human. We're programmed from birth and through our lives to act and behave a certain way. Salespeople utilize social engineering attacks to gain our business, right? This new security product is going to protect you against 100% of the hackers out there. You know, or this new intrusion prevention system will absolutely detect the advanced persistent threats out there. Or we'll protect your cloud computing. You know, all of these out there are, are, are sales jargons to make us feel a false sense of security, or maybe it does do it a decent job. Um, but in the ultimate name, we try to con people into doing what we like, right? So if you aren't if you aren't doing social engineering attacks as part of your normal security program, you're really missing out on a big attack factor. For me, if I'm doing a penetration test, I'm not going to go and try to attack a, a network-based buffer overflow. I'm not going to try to hack the latest and greatest web application firewall or a web application. I'm going to spoof my number. I'm going to call and say, hey, I'm, a, I'm the CEO of your company. I need you to download something for me. Or I'm ITE or I'm you know, your security you know, security administrator. Hey, I noticed uh, you've been visiting some strange sites and it uh, looks like you're compromised. Can you go and download this file for me? Well, you know, me, I'm like, yeah, yeah where I got to go? You know? I mean, that's just the way we are. 
So talking a little bit about social engineering, if you haven't been here yet, really great resource. Uh, Social-engineer.org. Has everybody, everybody been there? Good, good. Um, Social-engineer.org is really just an all-in-one resource and framework for social engineering. Uh, we also have a podcast, which I skipped ahead two slides. And the podcast itself, when we get high-end people that specialize in human behavior, when we get PhDs from Harvard, um, people that have published 20 books on human behavior, um, and the whole goal is to really educate people of really how we're programming. The latest podcast uh, that we just, just recorded two days ago, it should be out within an, uh, the next week or two, uh, we had a, a guy, his name's escaping me for some reason, but um, he published like 20 books on human behavior. And he asked me on the phone, he's like, hey, uh, Dave, you know, look to the left of you. You know, and I looked to my left, he's like, is your desk in a complete array? And I got papers everywhere, I got my pen, you know, I got my book. You know, you know, just all this stuff spread across my, my desk. He's like, okay, look to your right. What's my right? And he's like, what's there? I'm like, well, not really much. It's all orderly and everything like that. He's like, all right, well, you're left-handed. I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. So now I know by going to your desk or what you do in your behavior that you're a left-handed person. He's like, did you know that there's a higher success rate if you talk or whisper something into someone's left ear and they're left-handed than there is with the right and the right ear and right hand? They're left-handed. Because based on what part of the brain actually interprets what you're going to do will actually make you decide a certain way generally better than the other way. So you have like an 85% chance in my left hearing my left ear to agree with you than you know 60% in my right ear, which is pretty interesting. I guess published you know like insane amount of books. So I don't know. I mean, it can be fake, who knows? But uh, a really good resource to to go through that. The social engineer framework. Uh, really has basically everything you possibly need to, to perform a social engineering within your organization or learn more about it. Uh, really great resource if you haven't checked it out. So I released a new version of Set and Not Account. So it was about uh, a few weeks ago. I always come up with crazy names. The last one was uh, was a Rise of the Pink Pirate or something. Yeah. I don't know where I'm up with these. <laughs> Defcon 16, I was presenting on Fast Track, and uh, the offensive security team decided that it'd be pretty funny to uh, launch a lot of lemons at me. So while I was on stage at Defcon, I had about 70 lemons launched at me, and one half they gave me right across the face, which then just dis disoriented me, and I had no idea what I was doing. So, <laughs> yeah. so basically, it's, set. it's open source. It's free. You can do what like, you want to. It's like a lemon party? What? It's like a lemon party? It's like a lemon party? It's like a lemon party? What? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Right on cue. <laughs> so, uh, set is uh, open source. It's purely Python driven. Do what you want to with it. If you want to rename it and call it your own tool and you know, tell your company that you wrote it, go for it. I don't care. It's free. Um, it integrates with Metasploit primarily because obviously Metasploit is a framework, right? Everything you saw there from building exploits to launching exploits to creating your own payloads, it's because it's a framework. Uh, so, building stuff into it is what it's designed to do. So it's payload repositories, it's client-side exploits, everything like that. You don't want to recreate the wheel because those guys are much smarter when it comes to that. Focus on that, and the framework is absolutely useful for that. It's multiple attack vectors specifically designed for social engineering, hence the social engineering toolkit. Uh, it's for good, not bad. So Hall Pen Testers and Organizations Test Their Security Program. Who here is bad? Um, no. Hey, so everybody here is good, so we can only use Martin. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the different set attack vectors. Um, there's a spear phishing attack, and everybody knows what spear phishing is, hopefully. It's just targeted attacks against an organization, either via email or other 